welcome to Simply Learn. That's www.simplylearn.com. Get certified, get ahead. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Jupyter Notebook for doing your Python programming in. So we're going to cover the basics of the Jupyter Notebook. I'm showing you how it works and what it looks like. Let's go ahead and start with the install. If you go to jupyter.org, that's J-U-P-Y-T-E-R dot O-R-G, you can click on the install button, and then you can run the uh, prerequisites Python and downloads here. And you can see the setup on this. And you'll see the very first thing they suggest is that you install Jupyter using the Anaconda. So we have Jupyter Notebook, and then we have the Anaconda setup, and that's www.anaconda.com. You just go up to the downloads. Once you're under the downloads, you'll see in the Anaconda that they have it set for uh, version 3.7 or 2.7. I generally work in the newer version, although I did have to reset my Anaconda to 3.6 for working with Google's TensorFlow, which you can do very easily in Anaconda. That's why I said I remember the first time someone showed me Jupyter Notebook and Anaconda. I was so excited because of all the cool things you could do with it. So this is your install here. You can download it, open and run that. I happen to be under the Windows setup. It works on Apple, works on Linux. What's nice about Anaconda, with just the cool things you can do, the first one was Jupyter Notebook. Someone showed me um, the Jupyter Notebook, and you'll see this. Let me just flip back on over here for the Jupyter symbol. And then Anaconda creates environments. So it makes it very easy to create a Python 3.7 environment with the different modules installed. So if you're working with, I referenced uh, Google TensorFlow, had a little troubles with that and had to go to Python 3.6, you can easily do that. You can create an environment for Python 3.6. And that's all through the Anaconda. So once you've installed this, there's a couple ways to get to your Jupyter Notebook. So you'll go ahead and just download and run the Anaconda install. And then in this case, I go into my Windows and I actually have Anaconda 64-bit. And we can go to Anaconda. Oops, there's Jupyter Notebook. You can directly access it that way. You can do the Anaconda prompt. I can do Jupyter Notebook. Well, actually, I'm going to go back and do this the way I like to do it. But let me just show you what this looks like. When I hit enter on here, it opens up a browser window, and I now am in Jupyter Notebook where I can create new projects and go in here and create a new file running. And we'll look at that in just a minute on what that means. But let's go back a step. I'm going to go ahead and close out of this, and uh, we'll open up my Anaconda. And when I run my Anaconda, it'll start up here in just a second. This is the same, by the way, they have a shortcut icon, but it's the same thing as going down here to, let's see, where are we? Anaconda Navigator. So I'm running out of the Anaconda Navigator, which I just love. I just adore the Anaconda Navigator. And the Anaconda Navigator comes up with all kinds of cool tools. You'll see over here I have applications on, and it says Base Root. What you find out is if you click on Environments on the left-hand side, Base Root is the one that that defaults to, but I also have my Data Science, I have my Stockpole, I have another one that's called No GPU because I was working with some GPU setup. You can create as many environments as you want. I can go down here and create a new environment. I can tell it what I want in that environment, which version of Python. You can click on one of the environments and clone it. At the very end of Environments, this little triangle, if you click on there, you can open a terminal window. You can open it in different ways. The terminal window then allows you to use, usually like if you're used to Python, use pip install. You can use pip or conda install. Conda does the same thing as the pip except it looks for all the dependencies. So if I'm in a rush, I use conda. If I am working in this and I need to be tracking exactly what I install on here, then I use the pip. When you're in an environment, don't mix and match the two. Stick with Conda or stick with PIP because uh, you can run into problems with imports and reliance and stuff like that. So we'll go ahead and go under Data Science because that's what I enjoy doing, Data Science. And so when I go back to my home menu, you'll see my Data Science opens up and I have my Jupyter Notebook first thing. And there's a lot of tools. You can open up uh, our studio from in here. I've never really used Spider that much, but Spider is another Python editor. There's the Jupyter Lab, VS Coding. So there's a lot of steps in here. There's even stuff you can add in. Mostly I use Jupyter Notebook, and then occasionally I use our Studio. So I try to wrap everything in here. The first time you open Jupyter Notebook, you'll have this little install, because it doesn't automatically install the Jupyter Notebook underneath this environment until you're ready for it. And then we go ahead and just launch it. And it's going to open it up in whatever my default browser is. So it's going to go underneath my Chrome browser and open that. 
And once it's in the browser, I'm now in Jupyter Notebook, just like we did the other way. So we did it two different ways to get in here. This is, I've set this to my data science setup. You'll see down here I have folders. It's actually on my D drive. I pointed this to my D drives because where I keep everything. And I can go under Simply Learn, and you can see we have different tutorials and different things we've done in here over the years. Actually, over the last year, since this is a fairly new computer, this is over the last couple months. I think my oldest one here, yeah. Oh, I do have something from five months ago, but that was brought up, brought it in from earlier. So it's about two months old, my computer. And I want you to notice that the extension on these is IPYNB. And this is important because when you create a new Python file to run in here, it's going to create what they call an iron Python file. So in here, you'll see IPYNB. We'll just go ahead and zoom in. So you can see that a little better. There's our I, P, Y, and B. And we'll go up here to uh, on the upper right. And you can upload data and all kinds of things in here. But we're going to start with just creating a new notebook. So I'm going to click on here. And I'm going to click this one. We're going to work in Python 3. So I'm going to click on Python 3. And by default, if you installed 3.7, it's going to be running 3.7. I have to actually set this to 3.6. I went back and changed the environment to make sure it's running 3.6 in here. And we're now actually running Python script. So we can just go right in here and type in print. And everybody does this, the hello world. And then I can go up here and I click on the big run button. And it's going to run it. And it's going to print hello world. And just like any notebook, I can go up here to view a toggle header. So now my header is on. This is untitled at number four. We can click on here and change this to, we'll call this Jupyter Notebook Basics. And then I'll hit Rename. And so now you can see Jupyter Notebook Basics. And if I hit the little Save Disks, it's now saved my hard drive. So I can go back and open this up at any time. If we go back to this window, Jupyter Notebooks Basics. Right there it is. So And it's running. So these are the files I got up and going. And it's got an open kernel. Now, kernel, it opens up a kernel to execute the program in. And when we're looking at this, it's important to know that it's only setting up one kernel. So everything in your Jupyter Notebook is going to work great except for multi-processing. Even multi-threading works fine in Jupyter Notebook, but if you get into multi-processing, you'll start seeing some problems because it's only opening up one kernel to run it in here. And if we go under a kernel, you can see how we can restart it. Make sure you want to restart it. So any variables that were saved, let's do this. B, or let's just call it hello. Hello equals hello simply learn. Hello simply learn. We'll just print B over here for hello. Uh, so if I run this, hello is now stored. But if I go up to kernel and I interrupt, if I restart the kernel, hello is no longer stored. So if I print hello and I run it down here, it's going to give me an error because it's not stored. Or if I come up here and I hit run, it's now stored on here and I hit run on this cell, it's also, it still continues in memory. So it continues down there as long as it's not interrupted. And this brings up another interesting point is we run each cell one at a time. So when I hit the run button, it doesn't go through all the cells unless I want it to. And it's so easy to click on the run button when you're doing a lot of editing, but there is shortcuts to that. I can also do shift enter, and that's the same as hitting the run button. So it's running this first cell, which is labeled number four. We have our output from that cell, and then we can go down here and run the second cell, and there's our output from that cell. So it's literally running one section at a time. And when we go up to kernel, we can interrupt the kernel. If you have a long run, you can just stop it, which terminates the, the program completely. We did the restart, which resets the kernel. I always use restart and clear output, which then clears all your outputs on here so you know that those aren't saved anymore. You can go to restart and run all. So restart and run all will start from the top cell. It'll run it, then it'll go to the next cell and run it, and it goes all the way down. You can also do the same thing under cell. You can do run cells, so it's going to run the top cell and go down. Run cells and select below. You can see how that just runs the first cell and then moves down to the next cell. Then you can do run cells and insert below, run all, run all above, run all below. Pretty self-descriptive, so you have a lot of choices to run. The most common is either to click on the run arrow or hit the shift enter to run your code. And one of the really great things about this is once you start playing with it, it's so visual. I click on the cell, and I'm editing that cell. I come down here and click on the next cell. I'm editing that cell, whether I'm deleting it or whatever I'm doing on here. So you can see it's pretty straightforward as far as the setup.
And these are the most basic editings you can do, of course, is just to put your code in. And because it's such an easy input, it's so easy just to keep scrolling down and adding new cells in so that you can go back up and execute different portions of your program. Let's go ahead and do an input, and we'll set up, there we go. Let's add a space on there just so it looks nice. And then we'll put uh, print, hi, comma, name. And let's go ahead and run this. And a couple of things to note is there's an asterisk appears here on the left. So this piece of code is running right now. And the enter comes in in line. And so I can go ahead and type in my name, Richard. Hit enter. It says, hi, Richard. Let's see a real quick short program on there. This inline editing and output mix is great for doing presentations. The first time I did this, we were doing a data science predicting when the huge blowers on the sewage plant go out, these huge aerators. And when they go out, they cost a lot of money to replace. And so we were trying to come up with a code that would look at the different wobbling so they could replace the pieces instead of having to replace a whole aerator. So they could replace the bushing instead of having to go in there and replace the whole fan unit. The fan unit runs about five to $10,000. The bushing is an hour worth of labor and runs about $10. You know, the difference between five and $10,000 versus $10 is huge. So if you could predict when it starts to wobble too much and something's going wrong, but we did it visually, so we could actually see the plots on here and stuff like that, and the outputs. And we'll show that in just a minute, what it looks like to put a plot on here. But just for a quick rehash, and print, let's see, hope to see you in class soon. When you run the cells, they run top to bottom, and it only runs one cell at a time. So whatever cell I click on, that's the cell that's running. And you can see the asterisk appears, it shows I'm running, and once we type in our name, it actually prints whatever the output is down below. In this case, enter your name, Richard, enter. And it won't print, hope to see you in class soon, until I click on this cell and run it. And then you'll see, hope to see you in class soon. So you have a lot of control. You can work on one piece of code. Maybe you're loading your variables up, and then you can start executing the code based on those variables. But you do have to remember if the problem is in the cell above, you got to fix that. You can't just keep working on the cell below and expect it not to change the answer. Another important thing to notice, this is a title. You know, you use your comments to comment something else. But in Jupyter Notebook, I can come in here to the cell, and I can change the cell type to Markdown. And you can see in Markdown, it changes the colors and everything. And when I run it, you know, I end up with this is a title, this is a bigger title. So I can create nice titles in here if I'm working with a project and I'm actually doing a demo. I'm actually doing some kind of production. I'm showing the graphs and I've generated the graphs already in my Jupyter Notebook. Instead of going back out, putting that into a presentation, I can just open up the notebook, scroll down, add my titles in, and I'm ready to go. So you can see right here, it's very useful to be able to put to tag a box as, um, in this case, markdown for our cell. And then I mentioned to you that we can also do our plots in here. So let's go ahead and plot import matplot library as PLT, very commonly used that way. I will do a plot, let's just keep it uh, simple. One, two, three, four. And we'll just keep it as a straight line. So we'll do one, two, three, four, comma, one, two, three, four, x, y coordinates. And this is x and y, if you want to call it that. But it's your first set of coordinates and your second set for the matplot library. And we'll simply show this, plt.show. And when we do shift enter or hit the run button, the typo there, I forgot to put in the pi plot, since that's what we're using. Matplot library dot pi plot is plt. And when I run that, we're doing a nice straight line. So it's going to go ahead and do the figure size. It does a basic figure size 640 by 480 with one axis. And you can see it displays it right in line. So we can do a lot of work with this as far as any of your, pi your matplot library is going to come in in line and you'll see a nice display here. Again, just a diagonal straight line we're displaying. And if I wanted to, I could do something. Let's do this and just change this. Double click on it to edit it. Below is a graph of a diagonal line. And so we have our title. Below is a graph of a diagonal line. And then we have our nice plot of a diagonal line. And I could even break this up. Let's do this. Insert cell below. So now I've added a cell below this one. I'm going to put, let's do, take our plot show. And I'm going to put it down two cells. And I'm going to do this one as a markup. And we'll do cell type or mark down. I call it markup. We'll say, welcome to my simple graph. And so when I run this, it makes a nice markup. And then I run this cell and we get a nice plot show. 
So we have a plot plot and I run it and you can see welcome to my simple graph. Uh, so everything's nice and orderly. This is kind of nice because once you set this up you can see how you can create a nice presentation while working on your project. You don't have to even get out of your project to generate the information you want to show to the shareholders. And if it takes too long, let's say we're running this script. You know what, let's just kind of overload it here. We'll do a lot of plotting. I'm going to run it, and it happened too fast. If your kernel gets stuck, you can always interrupt the kernel. You can restart it or interrupt it. Usually you restart it because it's loaded data in there and you want to reload the data. But if I restart it here, remember we did that before? Whatever I had that ran up here where I set hello up to hello simply learn, that's gone. I have to rerun this cell to reload that data into the variable hello. And of course I can do run cells and selected below or run cells and just run all. I can run all and it goes all the way to the bottom. So it's not a big deal if you forget, but you can easily run all the cells. I do want to point out one thing since we did a run all. It's still doing some plotting in here and coming down for whatever reason. If you go to the top, you'll see up here in the tab there's an hourglass. That means this kernel is running. We'll go ahead and interrupt this kernel and I'll take it a moment to interrupt the kernel and stop it. You'll see that shut down in just a minute. Another, there's so many cool things you can do with Jupyter. I get so excited. And it's so simple. There's not like a huge number of hidden commands on the page, although certainly you can, there's all kinds of back-end stuff you can do. One of the things you can do in here is I can go up to File, and if you go under File, you'll see down here Download As, and I can download it as a, a notebook, which it automatically saves as. I can download it as a python.py file, so it would remove the non-Python stuff in there, and you just have your regular Python file. And I can also download it as an HTML. There's also the JS slice, rest, markdown, but I love the HTML, my goodness. I click on here in the machine, but I'm going to go ahead and open it. And it opens up in my browser, and I can actually take this code and just put it onto a web page. So now I have my HTML code of what I just did. You know, that's a lot of, that's pretty cool. You can flip that over so quick and easy. So we've covered a lot of stuff. We've covered that it runs in a single cell. We've covered uh, going through the kernel, interrupt, restart, restart clear output, restart run all. We've discussed uh, cells where you can run the cells below, run the cells above, run all, most common. We covered cell type. We've gone under file and we've seen where you can go ahead and download as a different version. There's a lot of other things in here, but those are the main ones. You can save and create a checkpoint. You can rename it. We clicked up here to rename. But if you're under view, let's say I don't want the header on, I can still just go under file and rename. So if I don't want to see the header and I want that extra screen space, which I like, I can toggle that on and off. I can toggle the toolbar off, put that back on with all the shortcuts. And to wrap it up, one more reference. Uh, let me just close these out. If you do Jupyter Notebook Repositories on Git, and I just go to Trending Notebook Repositories on the GitHub, you'll see all kinds of stuff on here that you can go practice with. You can pull what somebody else is working on. They have Practical AI, Deep Learning, TF2 cores, TensorFlow examples. That's the uh, Google TensorFlow I mentioned earlier, which is a neural network. Hanson Machine Learning. I don't know what any of these actually are other than by the name, but you can see they have a lot of stuff that's published on GitHub, which helps you get started. You find something you're interested in, you do a search on GitHub, and you'll find that Jupyter Notebook on there. It gets you some hands-on. And then just regular coding. How do you become a good Python programmer? You write Python code. That's the basics. So thank you for joining us today. We covered Anaconda and Jupyter Notebooks. For more information, come visit us at www.simplylearn.com. We do have an open forum for the community and people that can answer more specific questions if you're interested in Simply Learn. Again, thank you for joining us today. My name is Richard Kirshner. Happy learning and good luck. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.